Good morning, everybody. I, I make it 9.30 Apple time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll make a start. First of all, thank you very, very much for coming to a session at this time on Sunday morning. This is where you are using a vocabulary organiser. And as you can see from that slide, I do many things, but I'm standing here as the first thing here, as a, an EAP lecturer on the pre-sessional courses at Warwick University. Most of my track record in writing seems to touch on technology, uh, but just snuck in there is an analogue book, uh, which is a pen and paper book for students to record their vocabulary. So, that's me. I wonder if you could just wave if you uh, are involved in an EAP pre-sessional course in any way. Okay, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's great, okay. It's, obviously, the talk has relevance outside that, but that's really, really nice. Thank you. Okay, so this uh, is the aim of the session, really, to present feedback on the piloting of the vocabulary organiser last year. And one of the piloters is in the room, so I'm delighted to see Anna here. Okay, the talk is divided into two parts. The very first part will be just talking about the genesis of this book. And the second part will be giving you feedback on the data of the, that we collected in the pilot. So let's start with the genesis of the book. And if you could imagine that these are two huge channels that just came to one particular point. The very, very first channel is the history of lexical notebooks, in fact, starting with Michael Lewis's very, very famous uh, Business English book, which has been described as a book of blank pages uh, by detractors. Okay. Um, and uh, the commercial failure of Longman's, uh, as was uh, Wordflow, which was very, very interesting. And it also covers lots and lots of little local vocabulary organisers that I've encountered on my tours around the world, such as this one that was developed in Spain called a learner notebook. So that was one huge thing which influenced us. And the second really was developments in um, corpus linguistics. I would say the breakthrough moment very, very much came in the 80s with the uh, co-build project which actually was able to flag up word frequency and I've studied how that's developed. Uh, I don't know which dictionaries your students get their hot hands on, maybe the uh, Oxford uh, New Academic uh, Dictionary, I don't know, but you can't buy them at Mill and Print Dictionary, but that was seminal in what we wanted to do, this distinction between starred words for uh, production and non-starred words just for receptive purposes. So, all the different dictionaries have different systems. I won't go into those, but you can explore them. I will focus on one particular system, which is this one at the end. If you get the dictionary, you have a system of diamonds to show frequency. If you go to the website, it's a different system. It's a system which is, uh, if you can see there, divided into those little circles showing frequency and if you go into the, the actual numbers this is what you uh, see. If anyone would like a copy of this presentation that's absolutely fine you don't need to scribble anything down I know that for reasons of time I'll probably go a little bit faster than I would do normally um, but that will actually break down how on the website you can see right the way through five bands of frequency and then if you're not uh, if you're w the word's not in a frequency band, then um, it will not have uh, a diamond next to it. Do you have any uh, questions about this? Lisa is in the room from Collins. She is a lexicographer, and so she'll be able to answer all your questions about this. So it was this distinction that word frequency showed us, which was the other main channel that led into the development of this book. And what I found as I stood up at Warwick with my students when they arrived, I'd watch what they do and say, here's a, quest here's a, here's a, uh, a new word. And I'd just watch them write that single word down and next to it a definition in their own language. That's what I always saw. So I started to cajole them a little bit and actually ask them questions like, why don't you write it in your lexical notebook? And of course, even using the word lexical was a bit too much. And if I said, why do you write it in your vocabulary notebook? What's that? So I had to explain what one was, and they shot off and gave WH Smiths all their money and bought a ring binder thing. And I just thought, that's really a shame because, you know, you're just shelling out this money. And I don't mean that. I'm talking about pedagogically sound formatted pages for recording Lexis. That, so that's really 
the sort of frustration that I often feel as a teacher, which is, this is the moment I want to give you your vocabulary organiser and show you how to use it in your course. And this was the exact moment that nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, so really, that's how it all came about. This is some of the types of things that I do with my students in the classroom. I'm sure you do very similar things. Have a little game at the end of the first week to see what they remember. And funnily enough, they don't remember the word plenary because I very deliberately just said it once on Monday and they've forgotten it. They don't remember the word. So this work that's very, very famous from Ellis and Sinclair, just showing how quickly you can forget new lexes if it's not reviewed. And then digging into a key word that the students might need and exploring why writing a one-to-one -one translation of a word just isn't enough. And uh, m what, what is new for my students is usually con con collocation, excuse me, I can't believe I'm being filmed while I say that. <laughs> <laughs> Very much collocation and using words like word partnerships and showing them collocation dictionaries and connotation, which is wholly new for them and uh, giving examples like terrorist or freedom fighter, the same person. Okay, so uh, when I brainstorm this, students say what you absolutely need. I don't think you necessarily need to know the etymology of a word, but it can be helpful. I don't think you necessarily need to know it's all the synonyms or the antonyms, and are there really any true synonyms in English? But this is the kind of stuff that I was doing in the classroom. So, we also went to what makes good language learners, and as you look at what makes a good language learner, you can tease out a couple of things that were, were very, very exciting for us. Independence and this whole concept of being extremely organised in the way that you're taking down your lecture notes, absorbing new vocabulary. So, there we go. That's all built up to this. This is my uh, second baby. Um, by that I mean, it's not, <laughs> well, anyway. It's lovely. You can, by virtue of attending this session, get your hot hands on this. Uh, you have a copy. I hope you'll cherish it. I hope you'll take it back to your institution, have a look how it works. And if the only thing you ever remember about this is the fact that it's divided into two parts. That's what Corpus <laughs> Linguistics gave to us. Where are you going to put it? Just that little thinking of, OK, will I put it in the first part? will I put it in the second part? So, in part one, you can put all the words that you actually want to use and you have to write down a lot more than simply the translation. So, the first part is made up of word maps, keyword templates and phrasal verb templates. So, here's an example of a word map template. It's hardly copyright. Uh, although Tony Buzan had a good, good attempt, I think. Uh, but, I mean, these are the things that we're doing all the time, isn't it, in EAP and ES, uh, ESP. OK, you're going to do medicine on your course. OK, so choose your keyword, build up your word map. These are the kinds of formatted pages, very much inspired by Michael Lewis's green. It's not for photocopying. It's a whole. It's holistic. The whole idea is you're putting your words here. So, this would flesh out your keyword, a lot more space than just writing a translation, and then finally somewhere to put phrasal verbs, collocations and idioms. And one reason I'm standing here is I have discussions all the time with my boss at Warwick, who says academic students don't really need phrasal verbs. So this is a general English type book that I use on EAP courses. Could it be more EAP-fied? That might be something that someone might want to run with after this. But anyway, at the moment, there are places to actually store phrasal verbs, collocations and idioms. They look like that. That's the first part of the book. Second part of the book, A to Z. Absolutely the easiest way to find, to find your words. So you can just pop them down. OK, I'm just going to give you a minute to reflect on that question. As you stand there with your students. Uh, yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Just, just a comment on the idioms, really, because I suppose in lectures and in seminars they're going to experience mm -hmm. a, a whole range of different discourse, mm -hmm. idiomatic, mm -hmm. which they need to sort of note down and have it, you know, recognise. Yes, it's almost a catch-all for anything that's beyond the two-word or three-word collocations and, uh, and so on. 
So, these are the students that I'm faced with. First of all, they don't necessarily have a vocabulary notebook. If they do, it's very small, and they take it on trips and uh, try and write things down. Uh, when they arrive, they're often doing the things that are greyed out there, which I don't particularly think are very, very helpful, storing all their words vocabulary. Some of them, during the course, start to develop uh, good practice, such as diagrams, lexical sets. Uh, I'm a great lover of index cards. I spent a long time working in Germany, and uh, that's my own personal box of index cards. Okay. I notice nowadays nearly everyone talk, takes out their phone as opposed to a paper-based dictionary, and I've kept up to speed with what are all those apps? This one developed by the British Council in China, Quizlet, which I'm a big, big fan of. I do my yoga practice using Quizlet as a way of reviewing. Okay. <laughs> and um, I've also noticed that there's a fantastic opportunity in uh, app dictionaries like the OALD where you can actually flag up a word, open folders. I'm not saying one thing's better than the other. I'm just saying that students have got loads and loads of ways of putting their vocabulary down. But when they come to me, I think that they need training. So let me just sum up. This is the end of the first part. I've spoken really about the genesis of this whole book. And just to say, I don't believe that there is any way that you can say, this is the best way. Hey, look, forget everything else. Awesome new app, Quizlet, get it, buy it, all your problems are solved. I don't think there's one way, particularly students are different. But I do think that our students, as they arrive, are quite ragged and often don't have any real idea of what on earth to do with their new words, in which case a system is better than that situation. And I think that the type of learner training that I'm involved with giving this book out actually starts to embed good vocabulary practice. So that's the end of the first part. I'm going to move on now to the second part. And this was our great pilot. Thank you very much to Anna. Um, it's quite interesting how we did this, but as you can see, none of the students was unhappy that their, their teacher <laughs> was actually giving them this absolutely brand new um, book which had really just come out at IATFL last year. So the second part is divided as follows. I'll speak briefly about the pilot. I'll give you uh, some of the data that we collected and a few comments and then I'll wrap up with conclusions and just make a comment about the future, leaving you with time for any questions that, that you have. So here was the pilot. It was uh, five weeks long and four teachers were involved, Anna, myself and a couple of other <coughs> teachers. Uh, students had two types of forms to fill in uh, and those questions uh, covered quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, questions. So we got 79 back and not <laughs> all the questions were answered. And some of them were answered in ways that made you think that they do need to continue with their writing <laughs> practice in English during their in-sessional course. So here's the uh, quantitative data. And as I say, the PowerPoint is available afterwards, so you can study that if you want to. All I'm going to point out is we were really pleased. I mean, if you want to see data, look, did you enjoy it, asking all these people? And you can see there that a lot of them, either because they liked their teachers uh, I'm not sure, but they enjoyed using it, and it's very much stacked towards the left. How often did you use it? Lots of different uh, sort of things there, and I wondered how real and honest they were being. <laughs> but you can see that very few pe people actually used it every day, which is fair enough. But people were saying that they were starting to use it every uh, few days, which was nice. How useful was it? Again, great to see... Generally speaking, they felt it was useful. I think, again, it was for the first time in the UK for many of them. So, will you continue? And that's something that's quite interesting a lot, because that would be great. You're going to go off for a whole year. Suddenly, you don't have a friendly lecturer anymore. You have a scientific lecturer, etc., etc. So, quite a lot of things that would be beneficial if they did continue to use it. And which sections did they use? And as I look at that, we just put all the sections down. You can see that. One of the most popular ones was the new words. One of the things I think Anna and I found was that when you did word maps in the class where they opened the book and wrote things down, that helped them to use it. But what was really interesting... Oh, sorry. What was really interesting was the A to Z was massively underused. And I think that that was just because we did all this at the speed of light. We have a course where after four weeks, 
it's nearly the end. And you're going, what are we doing in the fifth week? Oh, it's all assessment and presentations and some. So you almost feel you've just introduced the book. So next year, it's six weeks. And I feel that's going to be a lot, lot longer. I, I know it sounds a lot, only one week, but it does mean that we can do a lot more work with the book at the, right at the beginning to start to embed this practice. OK, so what should happen next year? Well, it's very easy for someone to say uh, Warwick University should give one to all the students. That's what I would have ticked. Uh, whether Warwick University will pay Collins a vast sum of money to do this, I've got absolutely no idea. OK, so what kind of things did students say? Uh, well, those are a few of the comments. I'm just going to break off just for a minute and actually give you a handout now with all of the breakdown of the comments. It's not really for now. It's probably more for later, so you can try to do this. So you can actually just have a look at that at home. Uh, could you just hang on? Because we're actually going to come now in a few minutes to questions. You, you may be the first. Okay, I'd invite you <laughs> to bear with me as I continue uh, so we can use our very short, precious time together and then just have a look at that later and uh, if you want to go through it in more detail. So I am going to wrap up now with the conclusions, the sorts of things that we decided. So first of all, I thought there's so many lessons here introducing this that I thought I'd just put it all together as a set of PDFs and maybe make them available on the internet so teachers doing this could actually have a support pack. And I think that would be really useful for the new teachers that join us. I've just noticed that they rush around and everything's new to them. What listings will I do? What readings will I do? So actually just to have embedded good practice. Look, here, if you want to use this book, you can have a look at this. Um, we did very much think that the more you bang on about it, the more likely it is that people will sort of y use it. <laughs> and Anna's nodding very sagely there. So it does seem that uptake's limited. It's linked to learner training. And um, we would like to actually just get all those students after six or nine months and say, how was your, in how, how was your work? How has your master's been going? Did you use the book? Was it helpful when you had all those library books to read? Um, I just realised how low they were in terms of aut autonomy. I, don't, I, I know it sounds awful, mm. but you know they've always got their phones on, and I was so angry at the beginning, and then I actually realised that, that no one had ever actually told them that actually, you know, chatting in Chinese is possibly not the best way to spend your time in the lesson. So we now have a traffic lights policy on devices. Um, but I just think when I said things like choose your keyword. Uh, you know, they spend seven minutes wondering what that might be, and now I think, no, get more cards. I know what your keywords ought to be. You've got to be looking at argument, argumentative, arguable, arguably. That would be a good keyword. Actually, give more to the students at the beginning to help scaffold this process. Okay, and I also thought that even though, um, you know, you, they, they live quite near, it's not s uber portable. I mean, it is portable, but, you know, I just thought it might be nice to just say in the first week, put your name on it, where all the books are here. They're in the classroom, don't worry about them. We'll be using them every day, but don't take them back home, bring them back. That's, that's for later, so just have them around at the beginning. Okay, so what will happen in the future? Well, I'm looking at you guys here. Uh, if you want to uh, pilot this, contact Collins. They'll give you a substantial discount, I'm sure, for class sets or institution sets. But I think we just need more feedback because it's the classic thing, you know, like does homework help and how are you ever going to study that? And yeah, I just think it would just be useful to see what people want. They come, came up with great ideas, as you can see from the comments. You know, is there a good app? So I spend most of my life looking at apps because I want to compare all the different systems. Could we build in any academic changes and could we have any uh, more adoptions? So it's great to see the five-minute sign. 
just as I come to the end, because that's where we are, and I'll invite this lady here to ask the first question. We've just got five minutes for questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry I was late coming in. Perhaps you explained that at the beginning. The um, feedback you got, was it, was it all from one um, cultural language group? I noticed they, they all appeared to be Chinese, is that right? Well, it's interesting that you say that, because they went to groups that have been formed to be multicultural, but there is a clear predominance. Right, that's uh, something I keep hearing. I mean, yeah. The university I'm at is actually very multi multicultural. Yeah. Um, but I understand that many of the universities that... I'd say our pre-sessions, when you see a couple of Thai names there that are very long, so they're easy to recognise. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you get very excited that you know you've got a multicultural group. <laughs> <laughs> only, only 12 students from China and two students from Thailand. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Did you, uh, in your teaching as a teacher when you were looking at their essays and presentations, did you see any evidence of increased vocabulary awareness coming through in what they were producing? That's a very good question. I would say um, no. It's a terrible thing to say, but because I'm involved in the listening and speaking, and I thought it was really critical. This is why Anna and I are kind of cook, cooking up for next year: is to have the speaking, uh, sorry, the writing and reading teacher also singing from the same hymn sheet. Because I think there you've got they don't think about it, but actually, of course, writing's a productive skill. So why not the words you want to use? Put them in here. And I think with a little bit more time, it's my belief that this is good. Just because I, I'm, I'm standing here as a practitioner and I get frustrated because I want to talk about this distinction, I can't do it. So I've given them out, we've done our best, we've learnt a lot, and I think that looking for this kind of evidence might be a really good way. I would say that people that never ever reviewed for vocab tests suddenly thought, oh, I know there's a box of chocolates in the last vocab test, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to have to look at what I've sort of, you know, written down in order to get a good sort of mark but it's all very informal but maybe we can do more one I say more piloting that would be that would be great yes uh, I wondered whether you ever had a very explicit section of your lesson where you said okay five minutes now we're going to write another vocabulary book or was it just yeah. more kind of that's what we were talking doing, about scaffolding yeah. I just wondered how how explicit you were yeah I, I'd say <coughs> relatively explicit in that we started to do these five minutes at the end but I think that's the way to do it Absolutely. When I've worked with card index boxes, okay, end of the lesson now, write your words and give, give class time for that. And I just wanted to answer your question. Yes. It was very much embedded in the lesson because I was doing the reading and writing. So when we were doing the reading, it could be at the very beginning when you were pre teaching the key words and brainstorming new words. And then again later after meeting those words and new words, whatever you could do, and maybe paraphrasing what they had read. So it was a constant using it. Mm. But I, keep, I had to keep reminding them, take it out, use, this is where you can use it. They wouldn't do it themselves. One of the things, thank you Anna, one of the things that Michael Lewis said was the power of print as frameworks linked with your own handwriting. And that's behind this. Um, you can imagine that some of the students' handwriting was beautiful and I just did want to grab this. Oh God, that's awesome. If I could actually, you know, take a scan of that, people would be really impressed because of course they were good learners taking it seriously and doing it really, really nicely. Okay, there's time for another question, I think, just before we wrap up. But if not, then please, Get your hot hands on one of these. You only have to give that slip of paper to Lisa and she will make it Christmas Day. Uh, please also contact Collins or contact me if you want to do any kind of piloting. But otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.